A couple months ago, I taught a really great live class about some of the most common mistakes that I see adult piano players make. And this class was really valuable because one of the things that I have realized in working with adult piano players is that there are certain mistakes that people know that they're making, right? Like maybe you know that you keep playing wrong notes and that's really obvious to you, but there are also mistakes that people don't realize that they are making. And these are the mistakes that are really sneaky. And these are the mistakes that really hinder progress at the piano. Because these kinds of mistakes that you might not realize that you're making really hinder your ability to practice effectively and efficiently. They really get in the way of achieving that really big goal of being able to play a piece through musically and expressively. So I edited this live class and I trimmed it down to just the essential things that you need to know about the mistakes that you might not realize that you're making, and also the solutions to those mistakes so that your piano practice can be as effective and efficient as possible because this is gonna set you up on a trajectory that leads you towards musical expression. And if you're not being effective and efficient with your piano practice, there's a variety of trajectories that you could take that lead you to a variety of different outcomes. Some of those might be frustration or giving up or playing something almost as good as you wanna play it. But I wanna make sure that you end up at point B of being able to play something really beautifully and musically. So make sure you stay tuned through the whole class so that you become aware of all of these common mistakes that adult piano players make and how to avoid them. Oftentimes people have some confusion around goals, around setting goals, around the various sizes of goals. People will often come to me and they'll say like, okay, well, I know that, you know, eventually I would really like to play the Moonlight Sonata. Um, and, you know, someday I'd like to perform on a stage or, you know, someday I'd like to play in front of a crowd of people. But there's a lot of mystery around, okay, where I am right now and what that big goal is, and then how on earth do I get there? And so when it comes to goals, I find that there are some questions that we can ask that can help us gain a little bit of clarity. Um, and some of these questions revolve around like the size of the goal. So is it a big goal? Is it a small goal? And that is obviously gonna be based on how you feel about it. Like, does this feel like something that's really huge or does it feel like something that's pretty small? Does it seem like it's something that's going to be really, really difficult or something that's gonna be relatively easy? Does it seem like it's something that's gonna take you a really long time or something that's gonna, you know, take you a short amount of time, like maybe just a couple of weeks or maybe even a couple of practice sessions? Those are some great questions to ask yourself when you initially set out, um, you know, on, on your journey of trying to discover how to plan for your goals and how to reach your goals. Um, and then I, the, other, the other thing that we can think about is how do we organize these goals in a way that takes us from point A, which is where we are right now, to point B, which is reaching those goals. So um, we'll take an example and I'll kind of walk you through an example. But the basic structure for this is we always want to have goals that are varying lengths. So we starting with the big goals is great because you can put the big goals, you know, really far out in advance. And then we can start to ask ourselves questions to get to some of those smaller goals, or you can think of them as like little road road signs or pillars that will kind of lead you to that larger goal. So let's say that your goal is that you want to play the Moonlight Sonata, the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata. And, you know, you are at whatever level you're at right now, that doesn't even necessarily matter. But looking at that goal is pretty ambiguous because maybe you listen to the piece and you're like, okay, it's beautiful. I don't know how to do any of this. Maybe you open the music and you're like, okay, still, I'm not exactly sure what to do. And so we have to take that big goal and we have to start asking ourselves questions so that we can come up with the guideposts of, or the steps to take to get us to that goal. So when we start with a really big goal, a great question to ask is like, okay, is this short term or long term? If it's a huge piece and you can't play any of it and you've never touched it and it seems kind of hard, it's probably a long-term goal, um, it, which means it's also probably big and it's also probably difficult. So then looking through that piece, what are some things that you could do that you think might be doable? So maybe you are someone who's really confident with rhythm. Maybe you say, well, I'm pretty confident that I could clap this piece out loud and count the rhythm and that I could do that write it down. Um, or maybe you're someone that's pretty good at sight reading. So you could say, well, I'm pretty sure that I could probably 
with some time, read all of the notes in the piece. Okay, so write that down. Um, maybe you notice that the piece is 14 pages long. And so you say, okay, well, there's 14 pages. Um, so that's a lot of pages. I couldn't do that in one day, but maybe I could tackle 14 pages over X amount of days or X amount of months. And you start to come up with ideas of all the different steps that it would take, you know, to get you to the point that you know this piece versus where you are right now, which is not knowing it. And where people often get caught in this process is they start to like discount the ideas. So, you know, like, well, maybe I could read all the notes. No, 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 I couldn't do that. I, I don't know, there's too many sharps, it's way too hard, blah, 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 blah. And they kind of talk themselves out of it. Maybe I could clap and count the rhythm and then immediately kind of start to talk themselves out of it. And so in this process of looking at where you are now and where you want to be with these bigger pieces that you want to play, try to brainstorm from a place of anything goes. You're not going to discount anything. You're not going to talk yourself out of anything. You're just going to do kind of like a dump of all of the ideas of ways that you could approach learning the piece. And then you will pick some and you'll start and you'll get started and you'll see how they work. But where I see the big mistake happen here is that people don't let themselves get to that planning stage of like, okay, this is what I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try doing it this way or I'm gonna try doing it this way because they kind of talk themselves out of it or discount that idea before they get started. So you can kind of think of it as if you had um, 10 soccer balls lined up on a field and I told you that I wanted you to kick all of these 10 soccer balls a mile. You um, most likely, immediately when I say that, you most likely have an idea of how you would strategize to do that, right? There's a couple different ways you could go about it. You could kick one ball once and then kick the next ball once and then kick the next ball once and then the kick the next ball once and you could do that repeatedly and it would take you a really, really, really long time. Or you could maybe focus on kicking one ball a mile and then come back and kick the other ball a mile and it would still take you a long time but the process of getting there would be different and it's a similar thing when you look at that big goal and you say this is where i want to be we just have to think of okay what are all the ways i can get there and now let's try the one that sounds like it's the best for me so this is what i have adults do in the casual the confident program is we talk about the big goals and we break it down into those smaller goals and then we start to organize and we start to put them in an order that we think will get them from step a to step b and if you're someone that's been doing this a long time, you might have already experimented with that. And so you might already have a pretty good sense of what it's gonna take to get from A to B. And if you're newer to this, part of this process is that experimentation, is allowing yourself to try, just pick something and try it. And if it doesn't work, let it go and try something else. And if that doesn't work, let it go. And you will get to the point that you find something that does work. And then you know, next time, you're gonna start with that thing that did work. And that process is gonna get easier and easier and easier again as you go. But you have to be willing to do some experimenting and to recognize that like it's not necessarily going to be a perfect process. It's going to take a little bit of space for you to make those mistakes or space for you to have that success and then go forward with that knowledge. One, having a routine is very important. And so if you know that you need to have a routine and you're just stuck in that process of creating routine, you're already a step ahead. Cause some people don't bring that um, mindfulness to their practice and don't even think about creating a routine. And that's a mistake. We definitely want to have a routine and we want to have our practice planned out before we sit down at the piano. I was doing an entire live stream a few weeks ago about practice routines. And I was giving the analogy of like, leaving the house to go on a big international trip without planning anything, you know, like just hopping in your car and being like, all right, I'm going to the airport. I'm going to go overseas to Europe today. Um, that would be really overwhelming and you most likely wouldn't get there. And probably a lot of things would go wrong. And the same is true with your practice. If you just sit down at the piano every day and hope for things to progress, you're probably going to be sorely disappointed because you don't have a plan in place and you don't have an idea of how you're going to spend that time. It's okay if occasionally you sit down at the piano without a plan, but all in all, practice should be something that we're being mindful about and that we're really paying attention to the process of what we're doing and if it's working or if it's not working so that we can be effective and so that that practice of being effective leads to us also being efficient. So when we have the issue of what should the routine be, 
there's a lot of different ways you can think about it. And I've done tons of, of I, I've released tons of content on practice routines. And so I linked some of them in the, in the description. If you do want more specific examples of like, if you're a beginner practice for this long and practice these pieces, I have touched on that in other videos, but I wanted to give more of a basic um, formula that would work for a lot of people. And that would hopefully simplify it. Because I think when it comes to the topic of routines, it can get really complicated really fast, but it doesn't have to be complicated. Ultimately, when we think about our practice routine, really, it can be done in a formula. We can come up with a practice routine in a formula. We can think about what our goals are, and we can think about the amount of time that we have each day, and we can kind of like divide those by each other or kind of, um, yeah, divide those by each other, and that equals our routine. So if I want to play the Moonlight Sonata and I have 30 minutes to practice a day, after I've done my brain dump of all of the ideas of what I could possibly do to learn the Moonlight Sonata, I sit down at the piano and I spend 30 minutes a day doing it. And I take inventory of what's going to work and what's not going to work or what is working and what's not working. And then I repeat the things that are working and I don't repeat the things that aren't working. And there's obviously a lot more nuance and a lot more that goes into that. But at the base level, that's what you can do. And if you're in a spot right now where you're overwhelmed by the idea of creating a routine or maybe you've tried out a few routines and they don't work, I want you to think about it this way in a very simple way. What are your goals? How much time do you have? go for it. Start spending that amount of time that you have each day working towards those goals. And that can be a really great place to start with a routine. The thing about a practice routine is that it's going to take some experimenting on your part because I could, I could, I could probably literally sit here and talk to you for 100 hours straight about all the variations that you could make in your practice routine, because there are so many variables, right? There's so many variables when it comes to a practice routine, but ultimately, None of it would matter unless you are willing to sit down and test it out. And if you sit down and you test it out and you say, okay, well, this part worked and this part didn't work. Great. Do more of the stuff that worked. And the more that you can experiment like that and just try something and see if it works, the more you're going to learn about how to create your own routine. And I'll tell you when people come to me and they say like, what should I do for my routine? And I give them a prescription. If they're willing to try it out, that's amazing. You know, and if they're willing to say, okay, I'm going to do that, that's great. But even if I give them the perfect prescription, just the nature of learning is that in a couple weeks, it's not going to be the perfect prescription anymore because they will have learned and they will have grown at the piano. And so then we're going to need to tweak that routine slightly so that it grows with them. And so that it kind of allows for that learning and for that expansion of knowledge. And the same is true with you. So we have to be flexible in our routines. We have to experiment. So come up with something and test it out. And if it's, you know, you're like, okay, I highly overestimated the amount of time I could practice, cut down on the time. If you highly overestimated on what you could do in that amount of time, cut back on what you're trying to do in that amount of time. But it takes that experimenting um, for you to be able to find a routine that works for you. And it takes the skill of trying something and evaluating if it works or not to be able to continue to have a routine that works with you throughout time, throughout the entire learning journey, uh, because that's naturally what's going to happen is it has to morph and change as you morph and change. Um, when in doubt with your practice routine, uh, the other thing is just, just simplify. I think sometimes people, because it can be something that gets confusing fast, we have a tendency to overcomplicate, um, and to say like, okay, I'm going to practice, you know, these three pieces and this scale and this technical exercise and this lead sheet and this piece by ear. And that's just a lot. And it's very complicated. Um, I don't do a lot of technical exercises with my students. We do scales, we do theory, but in a very, very, very specific way so that it doesn't get so big and so confusing and so complicated because the simpler you can keep it, the more likely you are to experience success. And then you can always build on that success, right? You can always take that and elaborate on it in later stages, but simple is where it's at, especially if you're in a place of confusion or you don't have a routine or you're, you're not regularly practicing. Simplify, 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 and then you move from there. All right, so nonsense of the mind. <laughs> I was feeling a little playful when I made these slides. I usually call this mindset, um, but really what it is is nonsense of the mind. There are just ways that our brain likes to play with us and trick us and it has the best of intentions often. Like our brains really work 
they have good intentions, but it can really hinder our progress and get in the way of our piano playing. Um, I was reading something. Oh, what did it say? It was so good. It was like our like the the purpose of our brain is to is to keep us alive. Right. And if we think about our brains and how the sole purpose of the way our brain works is to keep us alive, um, that means that fear comes up a lot because we fear change naturally as humans. Like when things stay the same, they feel easier and they feel safe. And as soon as we start to challenge that, and as soon as we start to like push ourselves to think outside of the box or to learn a new skill or to try out a new practice method or try out a new routine, it's like, ah, oh my gosh, that's different. And automatically that's a little bit scary because it's a little bit unsafe. Um, and so the brain can get in the way uh, of the learning process in a big way. So I have a couple of, of tips and, um, and ideas of how to combat some of the mindset stuff that comes up. So the first thing that I see really often is that we're all just too hard on ourselves. Y'all are way too hard on yourselves. I see this so often. It happens actually across ages, but especially with adults. We want to see like huge results really fast and we want to push ourselves like very intensely and we want to get like those big huge wins um and all of that is awesome right like it's so great to have that drive it's so great to want to be successful it's so great to want to have those big wins but when it when that morphs into being really hard on ourselves and telling ourselves that we're never doing a good enough job or that you know this amount of practice time isn't enough so I might as well not even go to the piano or what's wrong with me why can't I play this correctly that is never going to be helpful in the learning process it's just not and so my number one thing to combat the the mindset issues or the nonsense of the mind nonsense of the mind is just to not be hard on yourself practice talking to yourself when you are practicing or when you're playing or when you're performing like you would talk to a friend or like you would talk to a five-year-old you know, if you were watching a five-year-old go through the process of learning how to play the piano or practicing a piece or trying to perform in front of a group of people and they were making mistakes and they weren't totally playing it correctly and it was, you know, not going super well for them, would you tell them how awful they were and tell them that they sucked and like get really hard on them for that? Or would you maybe be kind of compassionate and encourage them and turn into a little bit of a cheerleader and say, you've got this, you know, we just have to get through this point. It's possible. I'm gonna guess probably the latter. Um, and when we think about it that way, it one, makes it really apparent how awfully we're talking to ourselves. And two, it can also make it a little bit easier to show ourselves some of that compassion that can be really, really helpful in the learning process. We also wanna to try to keep our ego out of it when difficult things come up. Um, so for example, like if you're practicing and you keep playing the wrong note over and over and over again, if your re reaction is like, come on, what is wrong with me? Why can't I do this? That is getting our ego totally wrapped up in the process of learning because we're making it about ourselves. We're taking whatever issue it is, whether it's like playing a wrong note over and over and again, that's the example right here. And we're making it about us, about something that's like flawed in us or something that we can't do or something that we can do or something that we're not capable of. And the second that that happens, there's, uh, we're not really in a space to learn anymore um, because it's not really possible to learn when, when we're thinking about how awful we are or we're thinking about ourselves. And so when we have those situations and I've seen it a million times and I've experienced it myself too, where like someone's playing, they're trying to get something and they play it wrong and they're like, oh, okay, let me try it again. And they play it wrong, oh, okay, let me try it again. And it gets more and more frustrating and then that next you know, thought is like, what's wrong with me or why can't I do this? I, I always want you to just stop and take a breath. Just stop and take a breath. And the second that you start to think like me, or you know anything about yourself, just let that go. Because when you are sitting there and you're playing something and you're hitting wrong notes repeatedly, it doesn't actually mean anything about you. The only thing that it means is you need to change your approach of what you're doing. And it probably means you need to slow down or practice a smaller section or do one hand at a time, right? It just means that you need to change the approach to get a different result. It doesn't mean anything about you as a player or you as a person. And so if we can leave our ego out of it, there's a lot more space in our brains to ask better questions that lead to way more learning and way faster progress. And then these last two are kind of related, believing that we can do it and using affirmations. And I, I just released a video on Monday. It was a one of my tutorials and it was actually an affirmation video and I had never done something like that, but I've been using affirmations 
like my entire adult life. And I started in the last few years using them more with people that I, I'm coaching through the piano process. And um, they work wonders. They're pretty amazing because we all have a list in our head of like pretty, a pretty lengthy list of the negative things that we tell ourselves. Um, again, our brain likes to keep us safe. And so those, those negative thoughts can kind of go on a loop and we don't even realize it sometimes. And when difficult situations come up, if we have this huge negative list of thoughts and our list of positive thoughts is small or non-existent, our brain, of course, is automatically going to go to where we have more thoughts. We have more negative thoughts. So it's easier to go to that list. But when you start to use affirmations, um, which are just positive statements that you repeat over and over again, like I am a great pianist. I play beautifully. I love music. Um, you start to lengthen that list of positive thoughts. And then what starts to happen is when those difficult situations come up, instead of automatically going to the negative side, your brain starts to sometimes go to the positive side. And we can't Control, there's not a lot that we have a ton of control over in our life, but we do have control over our thoughts, which inform how we feel. And so if you're struggling in practicing or in playing and you're feeling down on yourself and you're feeling unmotivated and you're feeling um, bad when you're going through this process, I would highly recommend using affirmations because when you can shift those thoughts from the negative column over here to the positive one, it's going to completely transform the way that you feel about your progress, the way that you feel when you are successful, the way that you feel when you aren't successful. And it's going to make things so much easier. It totally transforms the way that people approach learning and playing the piano and also the way people approach other things in their life. Like it seeps into other areas of your life too, which is really cool. So test it out to get rid of some of that nonsense of the mind. One of the things that I wanted to touch on was self-evaluation or this idea of um, asking good questions. And it's slightly related to what we were just talking about with mindset, because if we can leave our ego out of it, if we can think positively about what we're doing, then that gives our brain a little bit of space to ask better questions. Questions like this question, which is how can I tweak it or do it better next time? And the, the funny thing is that oftentimes people are really willing to ask this question when they are successful, like when, when they're feeling good, but when we aren't successful or when we try something out and it doesn't work, it's harder to ask this question, but that's when this question is needed the most because it doesn't really matter if you are having success or if you're not having success. We actually wanna always be asking this question. Anytime at the end of your practice session or after you've drilled a section of music or after a performance, this is the best question to ask. How can I tweak it or do it better next time? If you ask yourself this question regularly, you are going to make loads and loads and loads of progress um, pretty quickly because you're always going to be evaluating like, what went well, what didn't go well, how can I do it better? What went well, what didn't go well, how can I do it better? Um, and then I, I, I put it again on this slide, just don't get distracted by the negative self-talk. Um, it's our brain's defense against change. And if you can keep everything related and coming back to this question, uh, you're gonna find some really, really good answers that are going to lead you to more progress. All right, let's talk about rhythm. One of my favorite things, um, and it's one of my favorite things because it didn't used to be one of my favorite things. I used to hate rhythm. I used to be so bad <laughs> at rhythm. Um, my college professor was shocked at how bad I was at rhythm when I first started going to school for piano performance. Um, so much so that I, I feel like a lot of college was rhythm boot camp for me, uh, where I was made to do lots and lots of like rhythmic training, rhythmic drilling, all sorts of things to really help me get a better sense of rhythm. And rhythm is so important, not only because it's important to be able to look at a piece and to be able to accurately interpret and play the rhythm, but because rhythm issues actually lead to a lot of other issues. And people don't often realize that the issues that they're having are, are related to rhythm. So when I hear and see people talking about hand coordination issues, 99% of the time it's related to rhythm. If you are making the same mistakes over and over and over again, and like you find that like, regardless of how you practice it, you can't fix the mistake, it's most likely related to rhythm. Um, if you find that there are pauses in your music, places where you just like, you always pause and you can't like stop doing that little pause, it's related to rhythm. And sometimes there's a little more nuance or a little more complexity there, but at the base level, it is related to rhythm. And so giving yourself a solid rhythm foundation is so important. And that's why with anyone that I work with, um, I have them count out loud always and uh, use the metronome. 
and combine the two. If you can learn to count out loud and you can learn to use the metronome and you can do both of those things most often when you're practicing, you will be pretty unstoppable in what you can accomplish and the difficulty of the level of pieces that you can tackle. Um, now, obviously it's not always easy to learn to count out loud or to learn how to use the metronome, especially if it's not something that you are practiced at doing. I rarely encounter people that, um, that learned this, you know, whether it was when they were a kid and they took lessons or they've taught, they've been learning on their own. I rarely encounter people that know how to do these things. And that's not because there's anything wrong with anyone. Um, it's just because they're hard things to do. And it takes a fair amount of dedication to trying to learn how to do these things in order to be able to do them. And I have so many videos where I talk about how to, how to teach yourself how to use the metronome and how to count out loud. And so I linked some of those in the description below, but at a very basic level, with the metronome, you can practice turning on the metronome and just practice clapping along with it and seeing if you can start to match tempos. And oftentimes when people turn on the metronome, it's this external thing that's producing a beat. And so it feels complicated. I know, I know sometimes like the clicking can feel annoying. Um, and all of that is because we're kind of like thinking of the metronome as this external tool outside of ourselves. But the metronome is a tool to help us develop an internal pulse or our own internal metronome. And so if you can listen to the metronome and start to, you know, clap along with it and trust that you can create that steady rhythmic pulse, that's when the metronome becomes a tool and it becomes this thing that's not distracting and not annoying, but something that is really helpful in keeping you honest about your internal pulse um, and the development of it or the maintaining of it if it's something that you already have. So if you've never used the metronome, I would highly suggest today, download a metronome app, go to Google, just type in metronome. Google, Google has a metronome and practice changing the, the speed of the metronome and just see if you can clap along with it and get really, really comfortable doing that. That's a great first step. And then same thing with your pieces. If you've never counted out loud before, I would highly suggest that you take one measure of one piece and write in the counting and then force yourself. And it's going to be hard if you've never done it before. Force yourself to take that one measure and just look at the right hand first and count it out loud and clap where the notes go. And then once that feels easier, do it for the left hand. And then once that's easy, tap it so your right hand can tap the right hand and the left hand can tap the left hand and do them at the same time. And that's how you start going about learning to count out loud. And if you regularly count out loud, so many problems will be solved. This is one of the one of the things that like oftentimes when um, when people join casual the confident, it's like, okay, I'm going to I'm going to do what you say. I'm going to do the practice methods. I'm going to do all this. But like they kind of hesitate with the counting out loud. And sometimes it takes people a couple weeks to come around, sometimes a couple months, sometimes people are willing to try it instantly. But when they do, almost everyone makes some sort of comment to me of like, okay, I see now, I see why you are so insistent on counting out loud because it really is a total game changer. You can't get distracted when you're counting out loud. You can't, um, you can't not pay attention and you can't see I'm, I'm speaking in a way that doesn't make sense. You, when you're counting out loud, you have no choice but to pay attention. You have no choice but to see the way that the hands are lining up on every beat for every measure. Your brain is so much more organized because when you count out loud, you know exactly where you are in the piece. And so all of the sudden, if you haven't been counting, it's kind of like you're in this web and there's not really structure. And the second that you start to count, you have like a very clear map and a very clear structure and you know exactly what's going on on every single beat. Um, and David, hello, welcome in David A. If you count out loud, your fingers play the wrong notes. Yes, that is very common. That's super common because when you start counting out loud and you haven't been doing it before, um, or if you don't do it all the time, then all of a sudden your brain is paying attention to something and it just makes it harder for a minute. But I want you to push through that. And when you're counting out loud and you start playing the wrong notes, the answer is not to stop counting out loud. The answer is to slow down or count out loud a smaller section until you can count out loud and play the correct notes because you definitely can do it. For sure you can do it. It's just about simplifying it to the point that you can do it and then building it back up from there. So um, that's very common. If you start counting out loud, 
go do it today. And if you go to your practice and you're counting out loud and you start making a ton more mistakes, don't be like, God, Ashley sucks. I'm going to stop counting out loud. Don't do that. Just, um, just go slower or break it down or work on a smaller section because you will likely make more mistakes when you first start learning a new skill. That's just the nature of our brain trying to process everything at the same time. Okay, I was doing some metronome slow playing earlier. Awesome, David, yes. I love to hear that, that's amazing. Keep doing it and keep at it. And like when you start to make those mistakes or when it starts to feel like it's really challenging, instead of taking away the metronome or instead of taking away the counting, just make the metronome go slower or just shorten the amount that you're working on, okay? And that will get you there, that you will have success with that. Just keep at it. That's awesome that you're already doing those things. Um, okay. We are now gonna talk about posture and technique, um, which are really tricky and really sneaky. And um, technique troubles, oftentimes people will come to me with technique troubles, and that's something that is, is pretty common because piano technique is just challenging. There's not really like one book or one video that you can watch to gather all of the information that you need about piano technique because it's so subjective to your body and your instrument and your environment and the piece you're learning. Um, so there's a lot of different factors there. But there are some basic things that you can continuously check in on, regardless of your level, that are going to set you up for success with your posture and technique um, to be able to use your body in a way to produce the sound that you want out of the piano. And I would say one of the most common issues that I see, especially with people that have been self-taught or that like learned as a kid and are coming back to it and kind of going at it on their own, is a big issue in one of these areas that then contributes to a lot of problems. Because when we have an issue in posture or technique, they tend to snowball. They're not issues that inherently are going to cause a ton of harm. Like if your shoulders are high, sure, you might have some tension, you might get a headache, you might have some like, you know, tight muscles in your shoulder, but that, that uh, mistake is gonna snowball into not being able to move your arm flexibly and not being able to use your, move your wrist flexibly, which means you're probably gonna be approaching the keys from a really funky position and so you're gonna be playing more wrong notes. So it's like all of these issues, while they seem small, they play, they're like a very important cog in the, in the wheel or in the machine um, that affects a lot of other things. So with posture, we always want to go back to the basics. And this comes up even with really advanced students that I work with. We have to go back to these basics pretty frequently. Um, so we want to make sure that we're sitting tall. We want to make sure that our shoulders are relaxed. And a great way to do that, because as soon as I start talking about posture, everybody st starts to like tense up. So you can even join in and do this with me right now, is to just sit up nice and tall and then take a, a big deep breath. and let your shoulders hang. Like let let you let your shoulders feel heavy. Like they're as far away from your ears as possible. And this is something that I encourage people to do a lot is just like close your eyes and take a deep breath and make sure you are relaxed and that you're not holding tension in your body. Um, we want to make sure that we're sitting at the proper bench height. So when you're sitting at the piano, this is a really really big one. You want to make sure that your arms are making this uppercase L shape. You're at a 90 degree angle. And if I'm sitting too high, my arms are gonna be in a straight line or in a more straight line. And if I'm sitting too low, my arms are gonna be making this V right here. And we don't want either of those things. We want the uppercase L or we want this 90 degree angle. That means that the weight can hang from your, from your shoulder sockets and your arms can be flexible and you'll be able to reach all the way the, to the top of the keyboard and all the way to the bottom of the keyboard. And you'll be able to use the weight of your arms to produce a beautiful tone at the piano, uh, which is also very, very important. Um, we wanna make sure that we are sitting in the center of the keyboard and that we are the proper distance. This is another really big one that I see, especially when I see videos of people playing online, people will send me videos often to and ask questions. <clears throat> and we wanna make sure that our arms are parallel with our torso. So I don't, it, I don't want to be back here like this because again, at the second that my arm is stretched out in a, in a more straight line, I can't utilize the weight of my arm to produce a good sound at the piano. Now I'm going to be pressing or I'm going to be pushing and that's going to result in tension and that's going to result in wrong notes and in an inability to move around the piano and in just a general in like non flexibility. I don't want to be too close either. So if I'm too close, you know, then I'm like really cramped. And again, I can't reach, I can't have that flexibility. So the arms are parallel to the torso. And when the arms are parallel to the torso, 
my fingers should rest on the edge of the keys. And that's how I know that I'm at the proper distance from the piano. I want to make sure that I keep my fingers rounded. Okay. And <clears throat> This is a big one too. These are just, they're all big ones. <laughs> um, we don't wanna play with flat fingers, okay? We want our fingers nice and rounded. If you look at the edge of the keys, they're in a straight line, right? And we play the keys with our fingertips. And if we look at our fingertips, our fingertips do not make a straight line. They make a big curve, like an upside down U. And so how do I get my fingertips to be on a straight line? It doesn't work unless I curve my fingers and watch when I take that upside down U and I curve my fingers, all of a sudden my fingers are now in a straight line and that's how I need them to play the piano. So curved fingers and I'm playing on the fingertips from the side. It looks like this. All right. Nice and curved. You're almost playing on like the nail of your finger. Okay. Not this part. You don't want this little dog face. You want to be like this. If you were to put your thumb, and all of the rest of your fingers together, they should make the shape of an O. And you can even do this with me. That's how you want to play, not like this. All right, lastly, in position, we wanna make sure that we're on the edge of the keys, okay? So oftentimes, especially when people are playing chords or when people are trying to play fast passages, they get really far back, um, like towards this fallboard or towards the wood of the piano, but we wanna be on the edge of the keys as much as possible. It feels less secure in the beginning, um, we, you know, we like to be in the keys because we have more to touch and we can feel more of the keys, but being on the edge of the keys will allow you a lot more accuracy and a lot more of an ability to move around the piano. Okay. Um, we're jamming through this. There's a lot here. Uh, and then these last two are kind of, uh, technique things. So once you have all of the posture correct, then you can start thinking about technique. But I would say like piano posture and all of the points that I just covered, those are the foundations of piano technique because piano technique is about utilizing your body in a way that you can get what you want out of the piano. And if you're not sitting in the proper posture or your hand position is wrong, you're not going to be able to do that point blank. Like there's not really exceptions that can be made here. You have to be able to sit in the proper position in order to get the best sound out of the piano. Um, and that, I'm not saying we can't ever make exceptions or um, that's not what I'm saying, but you just wanna make sure that you check in with all of these points and you start from this base level before we start to say, okay, well, this isn't comfortable for me or this doesn't work for me. Then we can start to work with some exceptions that might be unique to you or unique to your situation, but start from that place of proper posture. And then you can start thinking about other elements of technique. And this is something where people get, um, get really switched around. Like people will start playing the piano and they're not sitting at the proper height. They're not using a rounded hand position. They're not playing on the edge of the keys and they want to be working on technical exercises but or scales but technical exercises or scales aren't going to help you with any of those foundational posture things and in fact if you're sitting incorrectly and you're spending a lot of time drilling technical exercises or drilling scales you could potentially be injured um, or cause pain and so those foundations have to be in place in order for you to start thinking about other more complex elements of piano technique um, I see a question coming through from David and I will address that as soon as I'm done talking about technique here. Um, so when we think of these two points of technique, these are our starting levels, but they're great because they apply to a lot of things. One of the things we wanna keep in mind with piano technique is we want less movement in the fingers and more movement elsewhere. So when it gets, when we get to the point of technique where we're moving beyond the beginner stuff and, and now we're trying to play pieces like Chopin or Beethoven and we're being required to move all around the piano and to do long runs or big octaves or big chords, we want to think about how can I keep my hands in a position where I'm not moving individual fingers. You never want to move individual fingers like that. You want to use wrist motions. Like I want to be able to like rotate at my wrist and, and make this motion and that does the work for me instead of trying to move individual fingers. So how can I utilize other parts of my arm instead of just the motion of my fingers? That's a really great question to get you started thinking along the lines of proper piano technique once you have the proper piano alignment and positioning ready. And then another big thing is just wrist movement. You know, in the beginning stages of, of learning how to play the piano, we always want to make sure that we have this solid, let me do this where you can see it, this solid position where our wrist is parallel to the ground. We don't want our wrist to be down like this. We don't want our wrist to be up like this. We want this nice straight line that's parallel to the ground. 
And once we have that solid foundation, we want to have some flexibility there where I can drop and my wrist can go down and my wrist can go up and I can move around the keyboard and my wrist is nice and flexible. And oftentimes adults come to me and they have a pretty stiff wrist where, you know, they're, they're trying to play jumps on the piano, but they're keeping their wrist totally stiff. And at that point, we do want to allow for a little more wrist flexibility so that moving around the keys becomes a lot more easy. So basic piano posture and a couple of things to think about with technique, but regardless of your level, I want you to spend some time today or in the next couple days really checking in with those foundational posture things and making sure that you really are doing those foundational posture things before you practice your technical exercises or before you practice your scales or really before you practice anything because otherwise you're not setting yourself up for success. I'm going to touch on one other thing and then I'm going to answer that question. One of the most common specific things I see with adults is <clears throat> sitting and leaning back or leaning forward. So people want to be able to see what they're doing. And so people will lean back and kind of like hunch their, their head forward like this so they can see what they're doing. Or people will kind of like put their head right over the keys so they can look at their hands. And I'm not a teacher that believes that looking at your hands is bad. Um, you can look at your hands all you want, but look at your hands from a properly aligned position. So you still want that distance. And that's the number one thing. Keep the distance there. And then you can lean forward just slightly and look down. And then my fingers are still on the edge of the keys and they're still rounded. But what often happens in an attempt to see the keys is that people will put their wrists down like this. So they'll kind of like get rid of this part of the hand and put the wrist down so they can see better. And that is really, really improper and will lead to tension and will lead to um, an inability to move around the keys. So make sure that you're at that proper distance. And if you want to see what you're doing, don't put your wrist down like that. Just lean your head a little bit forward or lean your torso a little bit forward um, as opposed to putting your wrist down. All right, let's take care of this question in the chat. So David A is asking, could you say something about when the left hand is playing in the middle C octave range? I'm practicing the second movement on Rachmaninoff's piano, second piano sonata, and there's a left hand with alternating six. Yeah. So, um, and I'm assuming you mean technically, like when your left hand is <clears throat> in middle C, which can get a little bit awkward, um, depending on how you're approaching the keys. So when our hands have to cross or when there's awkward spots, like where our left hand has to go really high or where our right hand has to go really low, um, what you can think about is, is letting the motion come from your for like from your arm movement. Oftentimes when people have to do awkward reaches, they'll do really uh, unnatural things like contort the wrist in a way that causes a lot of pain. And we want to avoid that. So if you're having a left hand passage where you have to come up and play middle C, what I want you to try to do is to take your left arm and put your elbow in front of your torso and allow your elbow to guide your arm in front of you so that you can reach that middle C register. And it might be a situation where for this passage, not for the entire piece, but for this passage, you might need to scoot back slightly to get your arm in front of you and to reach that range. But then as soon as your arm goes back, you can lean forward back to that proper distance. Um, but what we want to avoid is we want to avoid the left hand trying to like do something funky with my wrist and have the elbow staying over here. And I hope you can see that okay. But essentially I want you to bring your elbow in front of your torso. Oh, that's a better angle. You can kind of see like I can guide my elbow instead of leaving my elbow here and like contorting my wrist. So I hope that's helpful, David. Let me know um, in the chat that you say, okay, David's saying that sounds good. I always find myself leaning towards the right. Yeah, and that's what we want to avoid. Like we can lean back a little bit, lean forward a little bit. You can occasionally lean to the left and right, but we don't want to do any motions that are super awkward or that are then causing other uh, discomforts in the body. So I would say try leaning a little bit back and bringing the elbow for, uh, in front of you before you try leaning to the right. Awesome question, great question. Any other questions you have about technique, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, okay, so we have, we have quite a few left and we are getting short on time. This has been a really great live stream. Maybe I will, um, Maybe I'll take some of these topics and touch on them in next week's live stream as well, but we'll keep going for a little bit here. So practice, is, practice issues, um, wrong notes, 
uh, repeated mistakes, pauses in your playing, difficult sections that you feel like no matter what you try, you can't get them. Um, that's kind of what I would consider practice issues. And <clears throat> My, here are my favorite solutions for those. And again, they might seem really simple. And when you when I say them out loud, sometimes they seem obvious. But these, while when we talk about them, when they seem obvious, these are the things that I have found people are the least likely to try when they're practicing. First of all, slow down, right? Go slower. Oftentimes when we are having issues like repeated notes or pauses or um, sections of music that we just can't seem to play and we don't know why, but we just can't do it, it's because our brain is on overdrive. We are trying to do way too many things at the same time and there's too much for our brain to process. And so when we think about it from that perspective, we need to simplify, we need to break it down, we need to make it easier for our brain to process. So we can do that in a few ways. The first way is to go slower. If you go slower, you're gonna have more time and space between every note and your brain has a little bit more time to think about what it's doing. Another way, um, would be to like focus on just one measure or just one hand, like break it down in a way that you're focusing on less so that your brain can understand it and then you can build it back up from there. Um, in practice, we always wanna focus on accuracy and we wanna use the 95% rule. So you wanna be playing it accurately 95% of the time. Um, sorry, you wanna be playing it 95% accurately 95% of the time. And so if you're drilling something and you do it correctly once and then the next time it's not correct and then it's correct and then it's not correct and then it's correct and then it's not correct, that's only 50% accuracy. And that's not, that's not good enough for our brains, right? And so if you can't have that accuracy, again, slow down or break down the section into a smaller amount of music so that you can have it. Because when we're practicing, oftentimes people will say things like, well, I just can't do this section. And that's never true. You can do it. You just have to approach it slightly differently. And 99% of the time, that means you need to simplify it. You need to break it down or go slower. Um, one of my favorite methods is the post-it method. That's one of, I call it a revolutionary practice method. And I talk about it a lot of times here on the YouTube channel. I do it a lot with people in Casual the Confident. And in, in the Facebook group, we did an entire five-day challenge where I took people through the post-it method. And it's a really great fixer for everything. It kind of helps you like iron out any issue that you're having in your practice. And so if you don't know what the post-it method is, I will link that video in the description as well. And um, it's a great method to learn if, you're, if it's not already in your tool belt, because it will fix most problems that you encounter when you are trying to practice. Um, David is saying, I did my grade eight in my twenties. You're getting back to relearning the basics. That's so awesome. David, welcome back. How exciting. Um, very, very cool. I, I, it sounds like you're playing some pretty great repertoire if you've got the Rachmaninoff Sonata. Um, that's awesome. You, David, and also anyone else that's watching, if you're not already in my Facebook group, that link is in the description as well. And we, we talk a lot more about all of this stuff there um, if you are interested in joining that. Okay, um, let's just, we're gonna fly through the next couple of slides. So lack of musicality. This is a big one and this is a sad one because we all start out wanting to play because we connect with the music, right? Like you hear that piece and you're like, oh, it's so beautiful. I wanna be able to play it that way or I wanna be able to express myself. I wanna be able to do that. Um, and, and we know how we want it to sound and then we get stuck in the process and it can be really disheartening and really discouraging when we set out to play music and we feel like it's not musical or it's not expressive and we can't get it to that point. Um, so my number one thing for this is to practice dynamics and musicality, just like you practice anything else. I think there's a misconception that, you know, when people are sitting down and playing something beautifully, that they're totally just feeling it in the moment. And that is true. You know, when I sit down and I perform a piece, I do feel it in the moment, but the way that I am uh, making those feelings obvious to the listener, like by dynamics and articulation and tempo changes and things like that. All of those things have been practiced. And so a great way to start is to start with dynamics and to really practice your dynamics so that even if you're distracted, even if you make mistakes, even if you are, um, you know, having like an anxious moment and you can't remember anything, your hands still do the dynamics because you practice them so much that they're a part of your muscle memory. And in the Facebook group, we also did a challenge that was all about playing expressively and we worked on this a lot. Um, and so if you're interested in that challenge, you can always join the Facebook group and we, where we talk about that. Um, and then musicality, it's complicated right? It, it's complicated. So don't give up if it's hard. Um, that's the other thing is like when we're talking about, oftentimes people will say that music 
it's hard to describe why and how we connect with music because music has no words. Music is all about like those internal experiences that we share when we hear it or that we share when we, we are playing a piece and when we feel it. And so it's not an easy thing to get right? It's not easy to really search within yourself and to find that emotional depth and to then translate that into not only a piece of music, but also like mechanically being able to do that on the piano. It's not necessarily an easy process. You can do it. You can 100% do it. But I'm just saying, don't be hard on yourself and allow it to be a little bit of a process. Um, I start thinking about the musicality from the moment that I start working on a piece, but where my musicality is the moment that I start working on a piece versus where it is when I end oh my gosh, it changes and grows and morphs that whole entire time um, because it's a part of the process, just like learning the notes or just like learning the rhythms or just like memorizing it. So um, give yourself that space and don't give up if it's hard because dynamics and, and musicality are just kind of hard. They're a complex subject. All right. Our last slide, performance anxiety. Um, and I'm going to be doing a challenge about this either in December or in January in the Facebook group. And performance anxiety, first of all, you are not alone, okay? I have yet to meet someone that doesn't experience some form of nerves when they're performing. Even professionals, we all experience it. Um, and when you see a professional get up and play in front of a group of people, it's not that they've like tackled or conquered performance anxiety and they don't have it anymore. It's just that the more you do it, you start to cultivate a relationship with the uncomfortable feelings or with that discomfort, right? Um, I used to get anxious and when I would get those feelings of performance anxiety, they would feel not debilitating, but they would feel so big that it was really hard to focus on what I was doing. And through performing more and more and more, it's not necessarily that the anxiety got any less or got any smaller, but it's that the way that I reacted to the anxiety and the relationship that I cultivated with the anxiety changed. Um, and so, yeah, know that it's normal, know that you're not alone, um, and know that you should do it. Just do it, because the more you do it, the more you're gonna learn about yourself as, as a human and as a performer and as a musician, and the easier it's gonna be for you to cultivate that relationship with the nerves and with the feelings of discomfort, and you'll, be, you'll come up with routines and with ways to help with that. Um, let's see, really makes me take a hard look at your own dynamics. That's awesome, Roger. So Roger's saying in the chat that someone ha um, really makes, I'm gonna guess that that's maybe your teacher or someone that you're working with. Um, that's really good. That's great. So I would highly suggest that you perform um, as regularly as possible, even if it makes you nervous, even if you have never thought you had any aspirations of performing, even if you don't feel like you have anything good to play or you're not, you don't feel like you're gonna be good enough, do it. You will learn so much. Performing is like getting a jump start on learning so many lessons that might otherwise take you longer um, because different issues come up in different ways when we try to play music for other people versus when we're just practicing on our own. Um, I have so much more I could say about performance anxiety. I did a whole live stream on it and you can watch that. I'll link it in the description.